silence stayed on because when I told him that Ibrahim was going to speak, he said, oh, I want to stay. One of my favorite artists. So if you have fans in the room, don't even belong to the course. And then Ibrahim brought two guests. So we have in the back, we have Francis, who wants to disappear. He's a studio assistant, so he's not going to disappear. And next to him, we have Nuna. And I'm very excited that Nuna is here because he's one of my MA students from my MA art market course at the University of Kingston. And of course, they all know each other because they're all from Ghana and they all went to the same art school, to KNUST, which is one of the best art schools, maybe I would say in whole Africa, but we will, you know, maybe stay with West Africa, um, where they basically, where everyone who, you know, is a good artist um, comes from, and curator and, you know, theorist mm -hmm. and everything. So, and I think that's also um, where Ibrahim, in a way, started um, with work for which he's known for, but which he just told me he doesn't want to do anymore, which is basically putting lots of sets of, um, um, coffee and coal sacks outside buildings and wrapping them ish. It's not really wrapping, but it's hangings um, because that was his graduate piece, right? Mm -hmm. From the MFA yeah. um, at the art school. And um, he drew quite a lot of attention with that and then quickly became known internationally. And I guess it all started out with a really beautiful, I thought, piece at the Venice Biennale in 2015. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Um, and then they got a lot of museum commissions um, in different countries, did a large project um, for, I don't know, I can't even mention all the different cities, but we did a big piece at the last documenta in Kassel, which was really well perceived, and what I didn't know, had a commission for the Rockefeller Center in New York with her flags, just last autumn or so. And is currently in the Ghanaian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale um, as a group of um, as part of a group show, and it's the first ever Ghanaian pavilion in Venice, which talks a lot about urbanization. Um, he does way more, so he doesn't only do public projects, um, but also does um, smaller artworks, photography, installation, sculpture, really, as well. Mm -hmm. But also, as he just told me, has started to really think about the arts infrastructure in Ghana and how the art sort of scene from the bottom up, I think, can try and start to think about sustainable infrastructures, right? Because um, we don't have them everywhere, as we all know. So, and um, and I don't, yeah, so it was by chance that I knew who was in London today and from him to speak here today, so I think that's really great. So thank you very much. Thank you. For, um, because he's currently, well, he's opening a show in Manchester on the 5th of July, so he's just been in the country and in Manchester to install them and organize that. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't really know what he's going to talk about because he said he's going to talk about something new. Yes. So, and about Ghana. So I think, um, you know, within our globalization topic, surely that will be, you know, very um, 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 suitable yeah. for way of a better word. Anyway, so now, because I don't know what to say anymore, I'm handing over to okay. you. Thanks for coming. And Thank you very much. <coughs> I hope I can speak quite loud enough. Um, can you hear me at the back? Okay. Not you just need to move forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, I don't know if many of you are not familiar with the work that I did before, maybe in the last uh, five years. So um, I basically I studied in um, in Ghana at the university, as uh, Stephan, uh, Stephanie said, um, at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Um, it's the premier arts uh, college in the country, and it's trained quite a number of artists, um, one of whom is very known, Ellen Atri, um, who's also part of the Ghana Pavilion this year at Venice. Um, but I did painting and sculpture in the undergrad level. Um, it's also because of the structure of the course, like when you come to school, you either uh, you study painting and sculpture in the first year, and then going forward you decide whether you want to do painting or sculpture, so you specialize. So I decided to do painting because I was more interested in the theoretical aspects of it, and also the structure of the department at that time was there were uh, a new group of uh, 
young professors who were beginning to redefine the, the curriculum and the structure of the course. So I thought that was something really interesting. So from um, 2006 to 2010, I did the undergrad course. And then I went on to do my national service. So I went to work at the Autism Center in uh, Accra. And it was just because I was doing some voluntary work already there. So I was somehow interested in like going between like the fine arts, making exhibitions, and also like working in these other sectors, fields. So after I went back to school, to the same school, to study, to do a, an MFA in painting, again in 2011 to 13. And then um, after that, I went back there to do the PhD in painting again. But I guess there, a lot of people always ask, why do you go back to the same place to study the same thing again? But it's quite interesting. Study, a lot of people quite think that when you know something and you know it to a point, like if you do an, an, uh, an undergrad and then maybe an MFA in it, it's enough. But doing it again and again, like I always came back to it from, a, from another perspective or from another point of view, because the more I studied, just the simple form of what a paint, like what painting was or what sculpture was, I started looking much more into it beyond its formal qualities and also into the infrastructure and the histories that somehow informed these uh, disciplines in a way. And in Ghana, of course, um, it, within our history, like uh, the older generation, a lot of them had uh, study opportunities where they went, they came here in England, they studied at the Slade in Manchester and other places. So the tradition of painting and art within our own history, when you came back to Ghana, was, was frozen in a certain moment in time. If you were looking at, let's say, art history, uh, maybe in terms of forms that were made in Ghana, um, and in terms of exhibition makings, they never really crossed the 1960s, you know. So if you're talking about minimalism or post minimal or land art or conceptual art, it was very difficult because the idea of uh, art, which was specifically reduced down to a certain point to painting and maybe certain flatness and all that. So, for instance, if you wanted to do an exhibition, the, there were a lot of uh, hotel spaces, of course, that were uh, within that period, like a post-independent period, and they lent their spaces, like lobbies, to like artists for exhibitions and all that. Of course, there were cultural centers and spaces that were constructed, but I think the very notion of art within that period, in terms of looking at the subject matter beyond the object or the surface of what was being made or represented, was somehow lost in a way. At the same time, you also have uh, post-independent, so we are talking about the 19, like late 1950s. Our first president, who was kind of a socialist, had this idea of building these social infrastructures around the country to somehow help like, the economy grow. Because as at the time, Ghana was the first uh, African country within the sub-region to gain independence. So there was a lot of uh, politics also within that time as to when the independence was supposed to be gained from the, from the British. So a lot of these things also went a long way to determine maybe the kind of infrastructures that were made within the time. Um, this particular image is uh, from uh, the railways in Ghana. Um, this, I think this is from the 1960s that this image was taken. So this is post-independent period. Um, there, there is a particular, the show I'm doing in Manchester goes much deeper into this thing. But there is uh, a group of uh, infrastructures that were built by the British from the late 19th century. And uh, one of the popular ones was the railways, which um, the Railway Workers' Union was very instrumental also towards the attainments of independence in Ghana. But of course, after a certain period, because of the Workers' Union, like demands for workers' rights and all that, a lot of these uh, institutions were somehow subdued by the state in terms of policies that were created and all that. But of course, in my practice as an artist, I've always been very interested in the labor conditions that somehow produce the things that we use or with the things that we've inherited, either being it histories or objects or even just like um, spaces that exist around us. I, for one, am not a believer that an artist makes a work of art and the work of art ends up in a museum. I think that the construction of the work somehow evolves around the, it's, it's like, the artist has to be involved in the, the process of creating the space, the institutionalization process. 
Uh -huh. So you don't take quite a lot of things for granted. I think I'm very interested in the political forms beyond just the making of the simple objects within the artist studio. So I started working, traveling around a lot within the country, looking for spaces that existed outside the formal spaces which were used for arts. So not looking at maybe, uh, because we, had, we have one national museum but it was started in the late 50s, but was never completed. So that is one project. And you also have these group of uh, silos, which were built by the Russians and Eastern European architects during the Cold War, but were also never completed. They were completely abandoned in the uh, mid-60s after this, we had this coup in Ghana. So there are a lot of histories here which are somehow intermixed, which have produced so many different forms of aesthetics, um, experiences, some of which you see all the time, but because those histories are somehow very visible and are hidden, and because of the aesthetics, you might be seeing them all the time or throughout your life, but you, you are never somehow really drawn to it. So my place as an artist, I think I was more interested in how we could bring those things into the discourse of art and somehow use it as a new point of like uh, discovering new potentials in a way. Because most of these things are heavily uh, embedded in this history of failure. So people don't like to be confronted with these spaces and these aesthetics and also the working conditions that somehow migrate from it. Um, so these are workers from the Workers' Union from, yeah, in, in the 1960s. Yeah, uh, this is uh, an image from um, Kassel. It's, uh, I don't know how many of you know Kassel. It's, uh, it's a town in Germany. It was heavily bombed in the Second World War. Hitler was using that as a military base. So when the Allied forces came in the Second World War, they, they, most, they, they almost destroyed the entire city. So there was a profess, German professor who proposed that because Hitler had uh, uh, somehow chased away all the creative scientists and people from Europe, in a way, uh, to create this art exhibition which would restore faith in Germany as a place uh, or Europe, so Documenta was created in 1955, I think, and afterwards it happened every five years. Um, uh, sorry, can I yeah. just say, yeah. sorry, I'm German, so obviously. Yeah. No, because it was very significant yeah. also what, what you were saying about placing yeah. and where you create these things, because Kassel was also, of course, to the border, to the Eastern Bloc, right? Mm -hmm. So it's only, I don't know, 20 kilometers yeah. or so to the former um, border towards East Germany, yes. so creating documenta there was also making a statement about how the good Western part of Germany was, you know, recovering and evolving and, and embracing creativity yeah. and democratic freedom versus the East. So I think that's quite interesting. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, the, the, the work that I proposed for Documenta was somehow also looking at some of these histories, the interconnectivity, because a lot of the locomotives that were produced were also some of the locomotives that were used in Africa and at many other places. And I think these containers or vessels or things that somehow move goods from one place to the other is very important because sometimes we do not really think so much about this. Like when you go to the cafe and you order a hot chocolate or something. You don't think about the political conditions that produce that in a way. So I think for me, that those containers and those labor conditions were some things that I wanted to somehow uh, engage with in a way. Um, and this is an old image, but the work in Documenta, I worked in the same factory, but it's no longer used. So uh, we were using the factory as this uh, production site where we're using it to produce the work there. Um, this is an image from uh, Liverpool uh, from 1927. Yeah, so it's uh, of some of the infrastructure that was uh, installed in Ghana um, in the early 20th century that were made here and just transported. So I also look a lot at that kind of history. Um, the railway guys in Ghana working at the station. And um, as I said before, I, I became interested in all these different sites. So I was, I was using them as sites of production. So the idea of working as an artist, the studio wasn't just producing um, work in a, a very traditional studio, but also going into these kind of contentious sites and then using them as uh, production sites and also with the residues and all that. So you realize the image to the uh, right hand side, or is it left or right? Yeah, right. Uh, you have. Uh, 
a group of people sitting on the railway the platform sewing these uh, bags yeah so factories okay so this was a, a former paint factory which i used in the production of a work which was presented at white cube in Bermondsey the last two years um, Yeah, so it brings me particularly to this that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about today. Um, sorry, I wanted to talk about this specifically, but I need to talk about that history to build up to this point. Um, so I, if five years ago, I started working on um, looking at what it really meant for an artist to somehow work and exist within a place and produce work. Um, is it just about making up objects? Or is it also just about looking at, let's say, social infrastructure? How do artists, in a way, intervene within the system itself, which they find themselves in, and use the condition and the failures as a new form of production, in a way? So I, uh, and also, as an artist, in working, I work with um, galleries and museums around the world. And there are, there are a lot of contradictions within the art world, in a way that artists earn money from their work. But there is never really any discussion or conversation as to the materiality of that and what happens within that and all that. So I have been very much interested in this theory of contradictions, like looking at capital and all that. So I thought that it was really interesting to somehow use that capital in a way of establishing uh, new spaces and infrastructure, in a way creating spaces that can somehow contextualize the scene and give it a new, like, uh, create all these different points which artists who are yet to emerge can somehow uh, develop their own like uh, voices from it and also developing spaces that can also contextualize work that has been done the years before so there are a lot of uh, older generation of artists who've done very significant work not just get, um, in the field of painting and sculpture but also in music textiles um, filmmaking architecture um, a lot of different fields, engineering, but a lot of them, their works were never really realized. Some t uh, w one thing I realized is that when you live in the West, because there are so many institutions and things are done all the time, for instance, between walking from here to uh, Oxford, you find so many museums. There is a cartoon museum, there's blah, blah. So there's so much. So sometimes you don't really think about it, you know. But when you find yourself in a society where the when culture is almost at a, cultural experiences are almost at the brink of oblivion in a way and at the same time you find there are so many people doing things but there's almost no, there's almost no sense of attention it almost becomes very alarming in a way so the question is how do artists use their position no matter what that position is to somehow reinvent the system itself so at least it can create a new path for maybe practices which are yet to emerge so the last five years, I was doing quite a lot of it, but I was also doing work with museums and independent projects, but I was more concentrating on the work with museums and others. But these, like for instance, this building, I started building it five years ago, and we built it completely from scratch. And the, 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 the images I was showing before from the, ra the, the railways and the factories, I was going into archives, borrowing all of these drawings and archives, and then trying to see how the, I could use that in a way, in a reconstruction of like these spaces that would be used like culturally and all that. Yeah, so borrowing from that history of failure and using it as a new point of uh, potential. Yeah, so the, I, I had to make a lot of decisions as we went along. So the drawings, um, like or for instance, uh, issues regarding light and because in Ghana, we also have issues with power. So you always don't have electricity. So what happens when there is no electricity? Does it mean the paintings and the artworks cannot be experienced? So a lot of like very small decisions. Yeah. Uh, so this is the interior. So uh, one, it's just a, an open space inside and it can be somehow reworked and then lights closed or done, whatever it is. Uh, so this is when we were starting to build the, when we're constructing the exhibition. And a lot of people come there and they think that the exhibition was built by professionals. But it not, it was built by students. I worked with a lot of students from the university. So Francis is my studio assistant, so he helps in the construction. So he supervised the construction process together with some local carpenters and all that. But the point is that each time we talk about 
like because people always say oh but in Ghana you or well, here we cannot do like very like world class or uh, serious exhibitions but I say no at the end of the day you don't really need such a big budget because sometimes you see like uh, some uh, exhibitions and you see the budgets and they're like over the top I always ask myself what does the money really go into at the end of the day of course I know people have to be paid and all that it's important but sometimes there's just a lot of unnecessary expenditure of course it wasn't cheap by Ghanaian standards to do this kind of exhibition or to build a space from scratch. But at least that sense of commitment, knowing that um, students who are in the university, who these, they are going to inherit this space because practically when I built, this is one of many spaces that we started working on. Um, the, the space, I'm not, I, I didn't build it actually to show any work of mine because I think my work actually is the process of doing all of these things, but it's actually what it changes within the system itself. Yeah, um, yeah. so I, I used to document the projects a lot throughout the years, and then a few months ago, I got robbed of my computer, so I lost all the images. <laughs> so I have to start something again and then start. Um, this, uh, I like this image quite a lot. There's two of them, because this is the same, I took this from the same position. Um, I think this was, I took this f three years ago when we were at this level and this is when it was completed and we had the exhibition. So you have a lot of school children coming and honestly in building all of these spaces, some of the ones you see in the next images, I'm not building it actually for adults, I'm building it for children because I somehow believe that in order to, um, yeah, in order to ch uh, chart a new path in our history in terms of the uh, appreciation of culture and all that in different forms. We have to start from a certain age. So I'm mostly, we mostly concentrate on children. So we are creating it, all our programming is around like schools, like doing workshops and then also like letting children have these experiences and like really opening up their, their gaze into the world. And you know, uh, where, I, where this space is built, it's not built in the capital, it's built in the north where I, I come from. And the population is quite young, it's only about 500,000 people. And um, it's also uh, Muslim, Islamic dominated. And these children go to like Islamic schools and all that. But I know there is this idea that in as, like Islam, you cannot make like uh, figurative representations and all that. But the Islamic schools actually we work with them. They bring their students to the school. So there was a lot, there's a lot quite to demystify. And also there's a lot of ideological shifts to be made if actually we want our societies to somehow move in a different direction. Yeah. So we have a very different form. So the first um, artist that we did the exhibition on at uh, the center. So this is one, the, this is one center that I, we made. It's called uh, SCC Tamale, so Savannah Center for Contemporary Art. And actually, it is, it is um, when I started building it, it was meant to be an artist studio. But three years into building it, I decided that I was going to use it for a space mainly dedicated to retrospectives. So all the works, we are working mostly with like older generation of artists to recontextualize their works. But this is where the catch is. The, the, because of the educational system, a lot of the older generation are very conservative and they somehow believe that, of course, the younger generation be, with, with all the, 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 the new curriculum and like teachings and all that, uh, because people are now like doing a lot of experimentation, photography, uh, film, like collage, like whatever. And before, like the, the, the form had to be very pure. So if it was painting, it had to be painting and the painting had to be on a canvas. So like this whole idea of a painting, yeah, so for me, being an artist who somehow trained within this generation and also our generation and coming to really understand the complexity of art across the generation, I thought it was very, very important to somehow create a space which would recontextualize these things, to somehow annihilate that uh, sense of misunderstanding and also antagonism. Of course, I think that antagonism is very important. You cannot do without it, but within our generation, what the kind of future that we want to build, we somehow need to create spaces that can eliminate some of these antagonisms so at least we can have a, clear, a clearer path. Yeah, so there are a lot of... Um, he, uh, so Kofi Dawson, uh, at some point after studying at KNUST, he studied at uh, the Slade Art School. 
before coming back to Ghana to work at the Information Service Department. And throughout the period where he was working as a government official, he was also making art. Of course, he sold some, but he also just made art for the sake of it. And he did a lot of experimentation. And among his generation, he's one of the artists who was very lit, who was less recognized. So I thought it was very important to somehow uh, build the entire integration of the center and also what it represented around his practice. So I started working with him from 2015. So I, w I also got the university involved, the Black Star Alliance, which you're familiar with, caricature and group, uh, Bernard Akwe Jackson, my colleague. So he curated the exhibition. Um, and together with like um, working with the student bodies and then, yeah. Yeah, so he, if some of the paintings that he did were also like copies of paintings from like history, um, which he remade, reconstructed some of them. Um, we had a talk um, the day after the opening and um, so he seated there with the curator of the exhibition, Bernard. Um, yeah, so most of the people that came for the talk were school pupil. Yeah, so that, that is SCCA. So this is um, another uh, space that I'm uh, working on. So actually SCCA is actually one of um, about uh, six different spaces that I'm currently working on. So that one was completed and we opened it. So this one is uh, another space um, actually. Yeah, so it's another one of spa six spaces that we're working on. So. I cannot, yeah. So this is the image that you saw before. And then you have uh, this, which is the studio space. And then you have this, which is uh, these artists' residencies, which I'm currently working on. And then you have these uh, um, uh, uh, accommodation residency spaces for visiting artists. And then there, you realize there's an aircraft at the top of it. So the idea of constructing the institution was also to somehow open it up to all kinds of um, all kinds of objects. So I started buying these old aircraft and like trains and all that. So the idea of establishing, like creating this institution, which was uh, because the, the premises of art is not just based on what we know or what we make in terms of the aesthetics. So I wanted to break all that. And the interesting thing is that all that land around it is part of the institution. So we are uh, looking at issues regarding agri uh, agriculture, like uh, building parks and gardens, like theaters, um, <coughs> Uh, like all kinds of experiences. The work I'm doing in Manchester, which is tied to the Parliament of Ghosts, is this amphitheatre which I constructed out of old um, seats that were used in the trains in the 20th century and cabinets and all that. So we are actually creating, there's an entire like uh, infrastructure, like uh, a building which I'm making just as a theatre which is somehow like a parliament, so you can use it for film screenings. And it's also because a lot of these cultures were lost. In Ghana, like post-independent period, you could go to cinemas to watch films and all that, but now there is none of that. Like, if you, like where I come from, um, if you, like for instance, my sister, I went to my sister's house the other day and the kids were really excited, like my sister was taking them out. And I was like, why are you taking them? Like, we're going to KFC. And I was like, I was so depressed. I was like, really? Like, <laughs> yeah, so it's, but a lot of people don't see it from that perspective. They're like, oh, but it's okay. You only, if someone is going out, it's either he's going to see a friend, he's going to a funeral, someone is being born, or he's going for a wedding. I'm like, that's not good enough. Or you're going to uh, get food. But, but why can't we create these new environments which are not just centered around. And the experience, I'm not talking about just things that you can go and see, but things you can also participate in. We need to create more spaces which can somehow increase this kind of democratic exercise. Yeah, so that's what this entire project is, uh, is centered on. So this is one of the buildings also. So this one is also almost complete. So I actually built this one as a studio space. So, um, the other studio spaces I spoke about is just next to this one. So I'm hoping that maybe in the next 10 years, we'll probably have about maybe 10 to 15 different uh, spaces dedicated to all kinds of things, theater, um, uh, uh, contemporary culture, art, uh, music, uh, spaces uh, for collections, 
um, both modern contemporary art um, school and art school actually um, also like collaborating with the university in Kumasi and also like some of the local bodies and institutions within the within the region so this is um, an image of the uh, one of the aircrafts that we got um, so the idea is somehow how do we bring all these things into a single frame because one thing I realized is that when I, when I bought the aircrafts and I had to transport them, I had to work with all kinds of people like aviation experts. Um, ordinarily as an artist, you just, if you were making a painting, like just hang the canvas and just paint. If you were painting an aircraft, you just paint it. But for me, I think it's important that these objects themselves are brought into the conversation. And the aircraft is, uh, it's not just like, uh, it's of course institutionally, like uh, when the um, people somehow come there to just to see the aircraft, because if you knew where this place, it's like in a village. So imagine like you uh, go, like it's in a village, it's of course in the cos cosmopolitan, but where it is, you'd be surprised that you have a child who grew up all his life and probably he would never ever get the experience to even look at one of these objects firsthand. Whereas here it's very ordinary if you're moving to another city, you just take an aircraft or something like that. So all these things somehow demystify the world as it is. Yeah, so the idea is to create spaces that somehow demystify the world in a way that it can open up the opportunities and the imagination of people so they can imagine far beyond what ordinarily they think that they will. And by working with museums and traveling around the world and making work, it doesn't just, it doesn't do anything. You ask yourself, if you do all the big exhibitions in the world, you've shown at Tate Modern, at uh, White Q, blah, 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 and then uh, 50 years down the line, and then what happens? For me, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't change anything. So I'm somehow grateful that at a very early age, I realized that it was important to somehow work on the institutional factor which changes the society to a point that a lot of things can begin to emerge. And I give a lot of credit to the university where I study in, in Kumasi because the painting and sculpture program is very good actually. And theoretically, um, Dr. Kari Kacha, who is one of the leading uh, 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 protagonists of his generation, somehow uh, has done a lot somehow to somehow create these ideological shifts in a way that we understand what it means to produce as an artist and what it means actually to produce work within a time where you ha actually have to use the conditions of the time as a, as a starting point. I think I'll end here. Uh, so if the, you have uh, questions, you can ask. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Questions, I think, that could come yeah. um, How do you get funding for this building? I fund it myself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things, uh, the important things. So as I, I was talking about these contradictions, of course, some of the works that I produce, I didn't show any of the works, but of course, I produce these very enormous works, and some of them sell for a lot of money. So what happens to the money? So for me, the money is just material. I don't have any use for the money, so I spend the money, the money in buying land and also building these spaces. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's incredible because I, I came from Hong Kong. Yeah. We were the most expensive city ever. And then I can never imagine something like space. this happening in space in Hong Kong. Yeah. Yeah, well, it depends on, the, yeah, it, I don't know, it's an individual thing. But we are trying as much as possible to cultivate things like this that can somehow generally affect the consciousness of uh, an entire generation. So they understand why they have to, and it's difficult. People always think it's philanthropic work, but it's not philanthropy. I don't think of, I don't like that word philanthropy. There are a lot of problems with it. I think it's a way of really understanding how the construct of the society or the world in terms of how things circulate and move around. And if we do really do understand that, we can know that, of course, at some point we can begin to rechannel and build things that can lead towards development of spaces instead of thinking about growth. Because people always think, once you have money, why don't we invest and have more money? And then, but it doesn't lead really to any, anything. What is your mindset of the whole management of all the spaces? Is it organizational or foundations? Or yes, because I'm working with a lot of uh, people within our generation. 
So like uh, young curators from the university, uh, friends and colleagues who are artists who are more interested in like uh, working with other artists and managing spaces. So for me, the most important thing is creating the infrastructure and identifying. There were some of these old spaces like this. Oh, yeah, you see these buildings? They were, uh, they are uh, government buildings which were made for um, housing affordable housing, but were abandoned. So they've been abandoned for a couple of years, like 20, 25 years. Uh, they look very interesting. So for me, I always go into them from a point of like looking at the shapes and forms from an artistic pos position. But a lot of the work that I did over the years was centered around using spaces like this as the point of production and making work. So most of the pro works that I do, I don't really wait for an institution to be there to produce it. I use things that exist around. But at the same time, how do we use or bring these spaces into like the cultural, yeah, like the cultural field in a way. So it's a way of somehow um, uh, trying to somehow bring like friends and colleagues and also people within our generation into somehow establishing like once the spaces are established, how do we manage and how do we create programs around it and let it grow? Do you think the lack, the lack of infrastructure has to do with the fact that obviously there are like some very traditionally historic um, of cultural production sites such as you know textiles and feeds and whatnot that it was just kind of left to, to that rather than trying to thinking about like you know this is also something that we have to plan for no I didn't it's because <laughs> the there was there was always a plan in the 19 like from of course from 1957 uh, uh, first president he knew that uh, culture was very important and infrastructure was also very important. So there were a lot of things that were being developed within the period. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight now, like we realize that a lot of our predecessors didn't quite understand, I wouldn't use the word understand, maybe. They somehow overlooked the importance of maybe certain spaces, yeah. Um, of course, now when I'm thinking about uh, art, I'm not thinking about it just in relation to like just physical space. I'm thinking about all the ideological aspects that come together with establishing that. And that within that period was something that was started. But as I said before, in the 1960s, there was a coup d'etat which happened. And that somehow create, uh, created this uh, break. Yeah, so I'm almost going back to the period between the uh, 1950s and then the, the mid 60s and trying to bring that trying to take that spirit and bring it back into the present to create something that can somehow uh, create uh, another kind of future so and also art you know there's this kind of misconception about art and culture and all that because we have a lot of different ethnicities and a lot of festivals and things that happen people always reduce it down to the oh but you have of course i fully agree all those things are important but the how we somehow the the, the institutional institutionalization of these things and how they somehow become a canon for generations to really understand and somehow stretch them is something that we have to somehow work on of course, they have a lot of art centers around the country. So when you go, you can go and buy art and craft, beads, blah, blah. And artists, like contemporary artists, have exhibitions there all the time. And um, of course, I think it's legitimate, but it cannot be the hegemonic form. So for me, it's about how to make, uh, create this multiplicity of different forms so at least we can have maybe more to look at. Yeah. Um, no, I think it was amazing. Like, mm -hmm. All the things you explained and completely uh, mind blown about all of the things that you're doing in your country and everything. I just now that you're here, I would love if you could uh, talk maybe about your work or how you define yourself personally as an artist because I personally don't know much about it, I have to say. And I'm really intrigued. And I don't know if you have like a, a one piece that you're most passionate about. That you could uh, 
I'm sorry I didn't uh, bring, I should have brought uh, uh, some images of my, my work. I, I recently, let me see, there is, uh, what is this? There is a, uh, this is TED talk I gave recently, I showed it an image. <coughs> yeah, so, um, where is this? Sorry, I'm very bad with uh, tec technology. Slideshow. <laughs> yeah, play from current slide. Yeah, I know. Okay. You got it. <laughs> I'm just slow. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so this was the work that I did in Castle. Yeah, so it's uh, made up of these um, jute bags. You know, uh, coffee. When you go to some of the coffee shops, they have these uh, Haitian sacks that the coffee is stored in. Traditionally, they are produced, they're produced around the world, but in, uh, most of it is produced in Southeast Asia, so from India and Bangladesh. And they are, uh, different countries buy them. Of course, those that produce like raw commodities like uh, coffee, cocoa. In Ghana, we were the largest producer of cocoa in the world for many years until like the um, 60s, thereabouts, when Ivory Coast took over. And uh, so Ga it's Ivory Coast, Ghana, Brazil, Nigeria, like Indonesia, like so. And um, the bags, when they are brought into Ghana, they are used to uh, transport cocoa from the, um, from the cocoa buying co companies that buy the cocoa from the farmers. And then it goes to the ports and then they offload the co uh, beans into special containers which end up here for like Starbucks and everything. But the bags remain in Ghana. So when the bags remain, they cannot use the bag again. It's only used once in its lifetime because of uh, the value of cocoa on the world market. So now they can use it for any other thing. But there are so many other commodities that are uh, made locally, but they don't have the same value as cocoa because of the kind of, um, th uh, I'd like to call it the myth that it created around uh, the bean in a way. So they then use it to bag rice, maize, millet. It goes around, the bag almost becomes like a living thing. It acc accumulates the soul and there are people who make them in the villages they have like tattoos and marks on their bodies, which is somehow in relation to the system. Because when they are traveling, they write their names and like some kind of biodata on their body. And those things are sometimes transferred onto the objects. So the objects almost become a representation of the conditions within the space. So I became interested in, because I was originally I trained as a painter. So making paintings, talking about these things, I became more interested in using the subjects in terms of the object itself as a point to start making the work the subjects matter. So I started working with a lot of these local migrants who moved from the rural areas to the city to do very odd jobs. So very centered on labor conditions and how that is implicated within the production of this. So I collect, I buy a lot of new materials and I give it out and I take the old ones and then we stitch them by hand. So this is a smaller work, but most of the work, so this was in Milan uh, a couple of uh, months ago, I think in March. March or April, yes. So, but they, they, some of them have been like really, really huge projects. So like, uh, in, like the largest project I ever did was like uh, maybe this, this, this school, um, like in terms of the entire infrastructure, maybe multiplied by 20 or something. So like really massive like buildings, like covering all these different buildings. And I work with a lot of different people. But at the same time, it's not just the only work that I make. I also make, um, the, the last work that I showed in White Cube uh, two years ago were made up of these um, wooden boxes uh, which was used in building this wall. And um, I've, I do photographs. Uh, the exhibition in Manchester, Parliament of Ghosts, actually I spoke about this parliament that I've built in the space. And it is also like a, a silo structure, an octagonal structure which has a seven channel film in it. And then there are two paintings and 10 photographs, and then also like a library, which I've built inside the space. Uh, so it's more like a, a space which you experience and you use, rather than just going to see uh, the work of arts in the museum. Yeah, so there are a lot of different work that I do, but I think this is the work I'm mostly most known from. But I've theorized 
a lot of my work and developed all of these, uh, the infrastructure and everything, actually from this point of view, from looking at all this system that I was talking about, like tracing just a simple object, like looking at it. For instance, if you think about how your mobile phone is made, like the number of uh, children that have to go into mines to extract very precious metals that can only make some components in the phone. We never really think about those things. Of course, in art, sometimes we don't, the point is not to focus on these things, but once you begin to uh, look into the, the production process, you begin to realize that there are a lot of things that are left out, mostly when the work ends up in the institution. So if you want to somehow liberate the idea of uh, the institution or make it a, a lot more democratic, then I believe you have to go back to the beginning point again. It's a very difficult point. You really have to go there and like, really go through the mud to somehow maybe propose new ways of experiencing um, or how the object can end up, the form it can take, rather than maybe the traditional form that it would have been. Because a lot of artists in the past would have taken the same material and then they would just stretch it on a canvas and paint on it. Like, oh yes, but this is when you can actually begin to bring. But no, the object in itself already has so much within it. So once you take it and you know a lot about it, it's now, you, you're now, you, I think now you're beginning to think about perspective and also position. And that goes a very long way to change a lot in the way that we experience the world. That's largely, if I think, the problem the world has mostly is because of perspective and position. That's one of the biggest problems. That's how people like Trump and others <coughs> get elected. Yeah, that's how Brexit happened. Position and perspective, very important. And it all comes from certain ideological positions. So we really have to think about these, um, these things. In a weird way, on this perspective and position, because um, obviously a lot of the stuff at SCCA, uh, you were talking about young people, and I just wondered how often you put uh, the work at their eye height. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I understand the thing that you were talking about, like in terms of the, also, that was one of the things that we were looking at a lot. So it's also about the kind of um, programming that I said, some of those things, how it comes down to it, because, we are looking at children, but at the same time, it's also something that is also very universal because there are a lot of adults, the, most, the majority of the population who spontaneously will go to spaces like that are also adults. But in terms of really focusing on what the experience of the exhibition and also what these gestures mean, we are more focusing on the children. Yeah. So of course, there are we, we try to translate uh, some of them like into films and like we're trying to establish like these different spaces like uh, gaming experiences and um, that's why I was also talking about the introduction of the aircraft, the ideas regarding the farming and all those things. So at least it will begin to expand the experiences just beyond. The idea of having a painting on the wall is just one of those things. And sometimes I think it's also, we also like for instance, sometimes I dwell on maybe traditional um, forms of experiences that already exist. Yeah, like maybe, of course, um, looking at the, the way art has changed from the Renaissance to the Academy, also to like modern arts, in terms of maybe how paintings are hanged and all that. We factor some of those things into consideration, but we, there are some images, I don't know if there are, we, I don't know if I have those images, but we tried, yeah. So this is the silo I was talking about. No, yeah, so. There are some parts of the spaces that we deliberately bring some of the objects to a certain point, yeah, because we want to make a specific point about it. And the first exhibition, the artist Kofi Dawson made um, these ants, yeah, made of these granite uh, shells. So we also worked a lot with some school pupils regarding the, 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 the fabrication of the artwork. And the artwork ended up uh, not just in, um, they, they're on a, a platform which is on the floor. And some of them are also like on the walls, which are also coming down to the painting and on the floor and all that. So sometimes there are things that you can actually also pick up. So all the time we find that some of the works are somehow moved around within the exhibitions. Yeah, 
So it's the first exhibition. So we are hoping that as we go on and we want to produce more exhibitions, which actually, uh, yeah, which can be more universal and also something which can be more spread out. Yeah. Well, some of these, the, the, the retrospectives, like for instance, these exhibitions are a bit more difficult to do that because of the timeline they are coming from. Yeah, so as we go along and we begin to do more contemporary exhibitions with like younger artists who are producing objects which go on very different levels and all that, all of those things would also take a different form. I have a question, if I yeah. may, um, on sort of not be because of scale, because of size, but yeah. so the question before about the work, and you were talking about labor conditions. Yes. Yeah? Because I've been, ever since I saw the work first, been thinking about maybe a different understanding of community. Yeah. Because I think there are quite a number of, uh, I mean, elements. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a work is never made by one person. Can you maybe talk about more about this, what community means, maybe either to you or where you're from, or compared to, I think, what we understand in artist studio means where someone sits on their own, you know, often, maybe in front of a screen or a painting, but it's, it's while this overspilling into also physical neighborhoods that I've seen, I think is really interesting and very different, I think, from how we operate. Yeah, I think from here it's somehow um, there's always this emphasis that the artist is somehow very important and individually you somehow have to create maybe um, you have to develop a voice or a form that can somehow pr uh, propel you through yeah time and space in a way but for us of course it's that idea was also existing for a long time and we use that within our own practices and all that. But ultimately, the idea has always been to create, to create a practice that somehow brings many different people together. Um, for instance, working with uh, either people who are within the arts or people who are not within the arts. Um, the, one of our professors, Kari Kacher, he was a painter. So he somehow thought that it was important to somehow use his practice as a painter, so he studied a lot of theory and all that, but somehow to use his practice in the development of other practices or younger artists. Um, like, yeah, creating a system which can spread things out. Of course, like, if you go to where I come from, like, um, people are not, like, individually centered. Everything is done more communally. Uh, if you live in a compound house and you cook, um, you have to serve food to all your neighbors. Whether they'll eat it or not, that's not a problem. The thing is that you have to give them the food as a gesture, you know? So when I was growing up, even in our house, like we had my aunts and other people living with us with their families. And then when my mother cooked, she had to serve, there was a plate which she had to serve their food for them. And of course, all of them cannot eat it, but it's a gesture, you know. And then they will also bring food, and then so the food goes around. Um, if you are, um, if you are the chief or the head of a family, um, and then you have twenty brothers, and you are the w most well-to-do, or you are in a certain position, it has to reflect within that entire system in a way. So it cannot be different when it comes to art. Yeah, in a way that you make, in a way that you produce. But it's very difficult, particularly when you are borrowing from a, a Western traditional form of making art, which centered around maybe institutions and all that. And you know that at the end of the day, you have to be somehow, yeah, you have to meet a certain standard. So um, the, the point I'm making is that all of these things are things that uh, they, they go around each other in a way. Yeah, so. I, for instance, like when I started making work in the beginning, like the, the jute sacks, I used to make them alone in the studio because I was doing my MFA then and I was still trying to really understand what they meant, like what was it that I was doing. But once I began to really open up my mind more towards the system that I found myself in, I think the danger is somehow trying to people try and alienate themselves from it because they somehow want to create 
some uh, a practice that is very pure, but you cannot do that. You somehow have to let a lot of things go. And if you consider the system which you find yourself in, in a way of producing, then I think the communal thing becomes a lot more stronger. So you begin to work with colleagues, um, people who are not even involved in the arts, who are like uh, who are doing very ordinary things and mundane things every day. Um, you begin to go to factories, you begin to realize that maybe things that are already in existence that are working could somehow even be the starting point at which your practice can be created in a way. And it's not just in the field of art. I think that if you, you can somehow apply this to many other forms, whether being it in the science or agriculture or um, geology, anything, yeah, sociology and all that. So, and uh, one of the things that uh, I didn't speak about was also the fact that um, we had a, a lot of these archaeological, um, we have a lot of archaeological findings, um, a lot of which dates back to the first, second century and even before um, of uh, early settlers in some parts of the country and also within the region. So, and in the late uh, during some time within the, uh, the 19th century, and it was between the 19th and 18th and 19th century, there was a big war that happened between the Germans and the British. And a lot of the machine guns which were invented and used within that time were used in the war and they were, they were completely abandoned. So the people, the settlers in that area kept them. So when you travel around, you realize that there is so much material, history or archival, like just spread around in different places. You might go to a place, a village where you think there is nothing, and you might find the most interesting things which somehow do not exist anywhere. Yeah. So in uh, trying to really understand what it meant to create things like this out of the conditions, it would it will somehow lead you into those kinds of communal things. So when I when I, I started talking to an older man who has been for a long time trying to create institutions like to make them more public. And uh, so we spoke about the fact that it's possible to somehow create an institution as part of the projects that I'm working on to somehow house a lot of these uh, remnants and all that. So maybe in the next two, three years, we'll have an archaeological museum also dedicated. So it cuts across. But it comes back down to the community thing because I don't think here you can just go to a place where there is um, there are some archaeological things and then say that you will want them and they will give it to no it doesn't happen but there is this, because what she, the question she was asking that communal thing once we really understand that it's really important that this thing actually belongs to an entire generation then you might be doing something else somewhere but someone else possessing something could be of very significant use to you. Do you think that um, Ghana having its first million is going to help this kind of ideological shift and bring about the change of that you, know, you are working towards? It can and it also cannot. It depends on what position you're looking at it from. You know, this whole thing about Venice is uh, one that sometimes can be very problematic, you know, because it's, um, there is a question that I ask myself all the time. What is more important? Is it that when you have, for instance, if you have uh, X amount, maybe one million, and you know that you can use that one million to develop maybe uh, a, some kind of a social infrastructure within a space. And that space has a population of, let's say, two people. And that's, it will go a long way to change those two people, which will change an entire system. Or you use that one million to create maybe a small exhibition in Venice, which has, which a lot of people will see it in the art world, they're important. For me, it doesn't mean anything. So, but at the same time, the paradox is that the thing about Venice can come back to effect because it means that um, if the exhibition in Venice is very good uh, and you somehow capitalize on it, you can use the success or the prosperity of that in a way of maybe uh, creating maybe other institutions in a, within a space. But I think it has to be coherent and also it has to be done very carefully. 
in a way. So, um, for instance, when I did Venice this year, it was my third Venice. So I wasn't overly excited about it. I was like, yeah, it's good. Of course, it was the Ghana, first Ghana Pavilion, which I thought was really important because uh, David Ajay, who is the architect, is really brilliant and he did a really fantastic job. Um, and the curator also went through a lot of pain, actually, to convince the government and ask also other people to make it happen. So the question that some of the artists, we were asking ourselves is that, how does this go beyond it in itself, you know? So if Venice is done, yes, it's important. But for me, I think that there is a lot more to it. If it fundamentally doesn't change anything going back to a space, then it somehow fails. So. When you say the our world systemic, do you notice differences between the systems in different countries? So the difference between, say, London's art world, Ghana's art world, New York's art world? Or do you think it's all just one system? Uh, it depends on uh, which point you're looking at it from. If you're looking at it from the point of circulation and all that, it's the same. It's the same logic that operates all of this. Yeah. For instance, um, one of the things has been that uh, for the, 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 uh, like there is a gallery, maybe there's a gallery in Ghana that says that, hey, let's collaborate and do this. And then you say, no. And then they, they're like, oh no, but why? Like, do you work with galleries in, New York or in London or institution, but, <coughs> but that's the thing. It's if you're trying to do something, like for instance in Ghana, I've spent the last five years trying to really understand this systematic thing. So for me, back in Ghana, there are specific things or concerns that I have. You get it. It's very different when you come to London. You know, in London, of course, like there are a lot of things already established. Of course, there's a lot that still needs to be done. There are so many revisions, but it's not the same as being in Ghana. So geographical thing, uh, con there are also geographical concerns that we have. So I would say that, okay, fine, in Ghana, it's very important to somehow, at this point, focus on developing maybe infrastructure, which will go a long way to change even how artists think about their practice. If an artist is always thinking about making an object as small as this, and he knows that because an institution has been built like Tate in Ghana, he can change the way he thinks about his work, and then he can start producing different kinds of sizes and different models and blah, blah. That's when there is success in a way. So if, for instance, there's a gallery of that same size, and then it's uh, mostly just uh, centered on like let's say commercialization and all that it doesn't do the same thing you know so the art world is all the same everywhere but I think depending on the different occasion then you have maybe its own uh, nuances and all that yeah and bringing the, all this back to Ghana how are you gonna ensure that these, all these projects are sustainable over, you know, you started with these ruins, you know, that are abandoned, so how do you think, I mean, I don't know, to be I honest, mean, yeah, no, because, so, because either, so if yeah. you say, you're going to finance that, then you put yourself under this pressure to continue to make work that certain people like and pay a lot of money for. Yeah, but it won't happen forever. No, exactly. That's what I'm saying. But yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, it won't happen forever. But it has to happen to a point where at least uh, the understanding of the form becomes a part of the, it becomes a fabric. And also, we also have to create local economies, ways of supporting these infrastructures. Yeah. So uh, in the north, there is this uh, share butter industry which is largely not really uh, tapped, like in terms of growing these trees and all that. So there are some of the things I'm looking at, like issues regarding agriculture and how that can sustain the institution, like locally. Yeah, yeah not yeah. like looking at it. I'm not really looking at it so internationally. I'm just thinking yeah. about first, how does it operate locally and how does it work with the community to change uh, the forms, uh, forms within that? And then in the future when other people inherit it, but of course, at this point, I cannot think too much about what it becomes in the future. To be honest, most of the time, I don't really care about that. I don't think about it. I'm only concerned with building it to begin with. And then once it happens, and then it proposes all these forms, and people see that it's possible for this to happen. Because mm -hmm. before, it was, very, it was almost like a myth. 
you never really thought that maybe you would have things like this would happen. But now that we know that it's possible, it doesn't really prevent an artist who is in art school from thinking that, oh, he's just going to make his work and then he's going to be in a studio and then live by himself. No, he has to understand that there is a much bigger concern. So people have to begin to be a lot, a bit, a lot more open uh, in terms of maybe proposing things that can go beyond just their practice. Yeah. So I'm just, it's faith. It's, it's all based on faith and hope in a way that is driving this. Yeah. Yay. Good. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you. Let's, yeah, let's pray for the best, yeah? Yeah, yeah, we pray for them. It will live, of course. It will live. It will. It will. It's not going to die. But uh, you cannot also plan too much ahead. No, yeah. yeah, you can't over plan. You have to leave room for breakdowns at some point yeah yeah we have to leave room for that yeah <laughs> well thank you very much well thank you coming, yeah coming here give another round <laughs>